Good morning, and welcome to the house of our God this morning, on this rainy, springish sort of day. Um, do any of you have any joys or concerns or announcements you want to share with the congregation this morning? Yeah, Joy. Maybe it has maybe it has seasonal affective disorder and it went south for February. <laughs> uh, anything else this morning? Uh, the only announcements that I have are uh, that there is not Bible study on Tuesday um, this week. Just a reminder: no Bible study this Tuesday. Um, and also, just that I'm I'm not 100% this morning. Um, had second. COVID vaccine shot on Friday, and it, it sort of cut me under yesterday uh, a bit. I, I'm feeling that, hope, I'm hopeful that today I'll get sort of back to 100%, but I'm just not quite there yet. Um, so I don't expect that to affect a worship this morning, but just in case, just in case. Um, the Moderna one, I think, is the one that I got. Um, so... Um, 
uh, Michelle had to kept, keep reminding me yesterday that this is how you know your body's working, how it's working. It's because your body is reacting to it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, if there isn't anything else this morning, then, we'll go right to our sentences from Psalm 140. Deliver me, O Lord, from evildoers. Protect me from those who are violent, who plan evil things in their minds and stir up wars continually. They make their tongue sharp as a snake's, and under their lips is the venom of vipers. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from the violent who have planned my downfall. The arrogant have hidden a trap for me, and with cords they have spread a net. Along the road they have set snares for me. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Give ear, O Lord, to the voice of my supplications. O Lord, my Lord, my strong deliverer, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further their evil plots. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Lord our God, we gather before you this morning from many homes and many families and many places with um, hearts and minds that are um, in various states of preparedness for worship. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come among us and focus us that in this time of worship together, your spirit would teach us and challenge us and comfort us as we hear your word proclaimed, as we offer our prayers and our praises to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to to stand and to wave to the people around you and greet them with a wave. Our song of praise this morning is number 492 in the Red Hymnals, Come Thou Almighty King. join our hearts uh, this morning in a prayer of confession, I invite you to respond to the words, Lord, have mercy, by saying, Christ, have mercy. Let us pray. Righteous and holy Lord, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, have mercy. You asked for my hands, that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. Lord, have mercy. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper, that I might not be accused. Lord, have mercy. 
You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I did not want to see. Lord, have mercy. You asked for my life, that you might work through me. I gave a small part, that I might not get too involved. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive our calculated efforts to serve you. Only when it is convenient for us to do so. Only in those places where it is safe for us to do so. Only with those who make it easy to do so. And only for those causes that affect us directly. Help us to see your image in the face of each person we see. And do for them as we would do for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our words of assurance this morning come from 1 John chapter 1. John says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, believe this good news and live in its peace. Amen. Join me in prayer as we prepare to open God's Word together this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, the first six verses of Daniel, chapter 7. Will you please stand for the reading of the word? Daniel 7, beginning at verse 1. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I watched, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being, and a human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear, it was raised up on the one on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. After this, as I watched, another appeared like a leopard. The beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. And our reading from Revelation this morning comes from Revelation 14, verses 6 through 13. Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Then another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And another angel, a third, followed them, crying with a loud voice, Those who worship the beast and its image and receive a mark on their foreheads or on their hands, they will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger. 
And they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image and for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue again this week in our study of Revelation. We've um, <clears throat> reached the sort of turning point, the halfway. Um, as I said last week, and the images that come from this particular cycle are uh, well, dominating images for the rest of Revelation, including um, the great red dragon, who is just that ancient serpent, the devil and Satan, um, the beast from the sea, which we'll look at uh, briefly in a little bit. Uh, the beast that's referred to in our scripture lesson this morning, those who worship the beast. Uh, the beast from the earth, which is also called the false prophet, who, who encourages uh, the inhabitants of the earth to uh, worship the first beast. But our scripture lesson this morning is um, the three angels with three proclamations to make, an eternal gospel to proclaim. And, and we'll be talking about some other things that um, exist sort of around this as a part of this, this whole cycle um, of the seven visions and its call for the endurance of the saints. But this eternal gospel which these angels proclaim, there are three angels and each one has a different uh, different piece of the proclamation. And the first one uh, proclamation is to fear God and to give him glory and to worship the creator, the one who created earth and heaven and the sea and all that is in them. The second angel proclaims um, the fall of Babylon the Great, sort of a, a little bit of a, a preview of, of a later section in Revelation that deals with Babylon the Great, um, but declares judgment against Babylon, judgment against the great city who has caused so much um, suffering. And then the third angel comes and proclaims that those who worship the beast or receive its mark will find no rest for eternity. Torment of sulfur and fire goes up forever and ever. And this is, um, like I said in, in our Bible study on Tuesday, this is this particular section of Revelation is one uh, which contains some of the most famous images, the, the beast and the mark of the beast. And, um, you know, I grew up in the theological tradition um, that, that made movies and things about this and the, the tribulation and things like that. And I remember watching one, I think it was on the campus of Northern Iowa, uh, big youth event, something, whatever, and we're in one of the classrooms at, at um, Schindler education building and um, watching this movie, uh, I, don't even, I can't even remember, Distant Thunder. Distant Thunder is what it was called. You know, and portraying the events of the tribulation and the wrath and, and receiving the, the mark of the beast and the suffering that comes after and all those sorts of things. And, and all of that comes out of this, or at least begins in this section of Revelation. But probably not surprisingly and not surprising to anybody who is here for the Bible study on Tuesday or who has watched it online since, it is not my understanding of Revelation today. Um, and I think that we, uh, we misinterpret um, some of these images. Uh, again, like I said from the very beginning, because we don't know what's in the rest of our Bibles often. And we don't see imagery which is drawn from other places as we go along. So let, uh, I just want to briefly talk about this beast from the sea, this beast that, that is worshipped by the inhabitants of the earth. Um, that 
that the third angel uh, proclaims judgment against those who, who worship the beast, who receive the mark of the beast. Uh, it says that they will receive the, the cup of God's wrath. They will receive torment with fire and sulfur in the presence of, of the holy angels and the saints forever and ever. Um, this is uh, the description of, of this beast is found in Revelation 13, 1 through 10. Uh, and he's described as the, the beast from the sea. The beast came up out of the sea. The dragon takes its stand on the seashore. And the beast from the sea comes up and it has, um, it has seven heads just like the dragon. It has ten horns just like the dragon. It has ten diadems just like the dragon. It bears a striking resemblance to the dragon that called it out of the sea. Um, it is also given the authority and power of the dragon. And it has uh, a leopard's body and a lion's, lion's mouth and bear's feet. Right? This is the, the description of the beast that comes up out of the sea. Um, there, Revelation 13.2. The beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and the dragon gave it its power and his throne and great authority. Now, the scripture passage that we read this morning from Daniel chapter Seven, and which is also an apocalyptic vision, um, contains something, some similar imagery. Uh, Daniel says, I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea. Just like the beast in Revelation comes out of the sea, so these four beasts in Daniel come out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion. Another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear. And after this, another like a leopard. Um, And Daniel later interprets this as, uh, or gives us the interpretation in verse 16 and 17, I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth. <clears throat> three of the beasts, the first three beasts which come out of the sea in Daniel's vision are a lion, a bear, and a leopard looking creatures. The beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13 has leopard's body with a lion's mouth and the feet of a bear. I don't believe this is coincidental. And if we apply the principle of scripture, interpreting scripture, uh, and the beasts that come out of, out of the sea in Daniel represent kings and kingdoms. I think it's reasonable to interpret then the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation as the same. Seeming as it bears the same imagery. Except the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation is a composite image, right? In Daniel, each of the separate beasts represents separate kingdoms. But the beast in Revelation is a composite image. It has pieces of of all of them put together into one beast. So it, uh, my interpretation then of this beast, is that it also represents kings and kingdoms, uh, but as a composite. Not just one, but multiple. Multiple kings and kingdoms, civilizations and nations and states and empires. I think this beast represents all of them. All political powers, civil authorities and governmental systems. All nations and kingdoms, republics, democracies, dictatorships, all sovereign states throughout time and history are are balled up together in this this one beast, that this one beast stands for all of them. This, this cycle of seven visions is, is, is God revealing to, to his people, is Jesus revealing to his servants the nature of the world. And this beast is a vision of the, the spiritual reality that underlies all the kingdoms of the earth. And it seeks, 
its own glory. And it wields the power of the dragon and his authority. And makes war, then, against the servants of God. Our history is littered with with examples of the way in which people, even even within Christian history, um, worship the beast, or the worship that the beast demands, requires, looks for. The old idea of, of this is, um, is two opposing systems, two opposing worldviews. One in which the, the beast is strong, one in which the, the kingdom, the country, the nation, the state is the most powerful. And, and the view of the lamb, which says the one seated on the throne is in power and is worth following, and is worth glorifying. That's where the first angel begins the eternal gospel to proclaim, worship the one who created the earth and the heavens and the sea and all that is in them. As opposed to the third angel, which says, those who worship the beast will suffer. It's revealing the spiritual nature of the world and revealing the consequence of worshiping one versus the other. I want to give us a little historical perspective on the relationship of, of the church and the state. Um, and so uh, I'm going to bring a few different things. Uh, and I'm not going to talk nearly... I could say a lot more about each one of them than I'm going to, um, but we just don't have the time to, to do detail work on all of these. But if you're interested in any one or more of them, feel free to s- talk to me, see- seek me out after if you'd like. Um, We'll start with the Roman Empire, 100 to to 250 or so. The Roman Empire, uh, sporadically, admittedly during this time, it wasn't until about 250 when it became systematic, empire-wide, and things got much worse um, for Christians. But but locally, in places, uh, Christians had a different worldview. And it, uh, you know, it took a little while for people to begin to notice these sorts of things. But Christians didn't do some of the things that were part of regular Roman um, society. One of those particular things is the idea of going to the theater. How many of you ever heard the expression that you don't darken the door of some place? Or you don't darken the door of the theater? Um, it comes from, from way back. Because in the Roman period, uh, like it was in the Greek period before that, the theater, um, theater and plays and things like that were part of a religious observation. It was a celebration of, of gods and, and worship in some capacity and, and all of those things that you would go to the, to the amphitheater for to be able to see. It was part of a, a, a religious observance. And so Christians began to not go to these things. You just didn't go. And, and not only was it a part of, of the religious servants, it was perceived as, as, as your sort of civic duty, civic responsibility. It's part of being a part of the culture is you're supposed to go to these things and do these things. And Christians didn't. And so they began to be noticed for being odd and being antisocial, for being um, atheists. They were accused of being atheists. Uh, because they wouldn't worship the gods and um, other sorts of things. There's also in, in this period the, what is known as the cult of the emperor. Um, as in many ancient civilizations, um, the, the leader, the emperor, the pharaoh, whomever, is perceived as a, as a sort of god in human form. And, and um, I believe Augustus got this um, for Caesar, for Julius Caesar, um, afterwards, and then just sort of adopted the mantle as well. So the Caesar is essentially a god, and, and one would be required to pay homage to that god, to swear allegiance to that god, and proclaim your unwavering loyalty to the emperor. And if um, that meant that there, were, there, would, they would, there would be a statue of the emperor in whatever your local city is, uh, eventually. 
And if you wouldn't bow down to that statue and wouldn't swear your, your loyalty and your allegiance to the emperor, uh, then you would suffer for it. And Christians wouldn't. For, I think, what should be obvious reasons to you, they would not. And many of them were brought into, then, as a result, um, they were imprisoned, they were killed. Um, uh, one says, if for nothing else, just for their stubbornness, um, they should be killed. Uh, and they became spectacles as they were burned alive or torn limb from limb by wild animals in the arena. The state demanded allegiance. And the Christians didn't, and they were um, slaughtered for it. We get some semblance of this in, in Revelation in the seven letters too, right? Um, I know that you, you feel powerless, but you are rich. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. We're going to jump ahead to the 14th century, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, did anybody see the movie The Two Popes? Yeah, I didn't either. Um, <laughs> um, does everybody know there was a time when there were two popes at the same time? This is the period. In some, of, in some of this time period, there were actually three popes. Um, that... Um, one pope was elected by the cardinals, um, as is typically fashion, and then they became unhappy with this pope, and so uh, they went elsewhere and elected another pope, the same group of cardinals. So you had one pope that was in Rome, and you had one pope that was in France. And as you might imagine, um, people took sides, right? And I don't think that people took sides in this uh, battle of the two popes uh, based on which pope they thought was most faithful or best represented um, the, the way of Jesus. Countries and nations and kings took up sides in this battle between these popes based on what was in their um, national interest what was best for their, their kingdom or their, their country. It's not about Christian life and witness, but it's about nationality and it's about national allegiance. So clearly, France chose the Pope that was in France. Italy chose the Pope that was in Italy. Spain chose the cho Pope that was in France. Uh, and all those sort of allegiances take... <clears throat> take shape based around cultural identity and nationality, first and foremost. We're going to jump ahead another few centuries to 1914 and the Western Front of World War I. Um, you guys know about the Christmas truce? This is a picture from the Christmas truce where um, on Christmas... Reportedly, on various places on the Western Front and to some extent the Eastern Front, the um, <clears throat> story I always heard was that, uh, that one side began singing Silent Night. And then the other side began singing along. German on one side, English probably, maybe a little French on the other side. And then they spent Christmas Day exchanging trinkets with one another, not, not a single shot is fired. They get up, they go out, they talk to one another. They trade souvenirs with one another, food with one another. They even play a game of soccer in some places. There are pictures of, of them playing soccer on the battlefield in no man's land between the trenches. Right? And then, the next day, or the day after, um, or the day after, depending on, on source material or where you're lo located, these folks go back to shooting each other. They were brought together for a day because of their common respect and their common um, allegiance to that baby Jesus. Singing his songs, singing his praises, 
They shared a common bond of Christian faith. And some people perceive this story or view this story as a, as a story about the, the power of, of sort of the Christmas spirits. And wow, isn't that a great story about how people could, could stop their fighting. They're in the middle of a war. I mean, early in the war, but the middle of a war. And stop their fighting. That's not how I see this story. I view this story as a horror story. Because... Here are people who, who have a common bond in Christ and have this, this moment of, of realization. And then a day later or two days later, they go back to killing one another for the sake of their nation, for the sake of their state. They're shooting at other people with whom people with whom they were singing Silent Night together the day before, and whether that's just because of their own. In some, there are reports in some places that um, that folks didn't want to go back, but they were threatened with uh, essentially threatened with with punishment or execution for for dereliction of duty, and forced to do so. Shoot or be shot. Government says you need to fight. You need to kill those people over there, so do it. People that they've been singing Silent Night with two days before. Blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord, Revelation says. Twenty years later, we get this. This is the flag of the Deutsch Christen, the German Christians, a section of the the German Evangelical Church in um, Nazi Germany, beginning in 1933. Um, In 1933, this particular group was voted into power in the assemblies and the the whatever of, of the German Evangelical Church. Blatant, open supporters of the Nazi regime with everything that it stood for, everything that they wanted to do. Most German Christians supported Hitler and the Nazi party. Not all, but most. Their faith and their nationalism were tied together. They were German Christians. Those that were part of the German evangelical church which rejected Nazism, many were imprisoned, many were killed. Um, They were called the the confessional church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a theological sort of giant that was one of those sorts of folks. Um, I read about a time when um, Hitler called in three bishops, I guess maybe the three bishops of the German evangelical church at the time, Um, They're Lutheran, essentially. Uh, It's a little combination of Lutheran, Reformed, um, and other, but mostly Lutheran theology. Uh, It comes out of Germany. Um, The three bishops, these three bishops were invited to come, and Hitler is looking to, seeking their loyalty. And of the three bishops, two of them signed their loyalty to Adolf Hitler, and the third one did not. That third one eventually found himself in a concentration camp because he would not give his allegiance to the Reich. But many, many, many Christians did. Early on especially, it kind of waned over time when the truth about Hitler's intentions became more and more clear because, you know, he doesn't go out and say all at once, hey, this is what I want to do. By the way, I also want to destroy the church, but I'm not going to tell you that right now because I want your allegiance. And he got it. The swastika in the center of the cross. 
The Christian church is not immune to the effects of, of nationalism. And the people that refused found themselves in a concentration camp or worse. They did not cling to life even in the face of death. Now I have one more for you. We talk about nationalism and we talk about the worship of the, the beast or the state. These two guys have recently been at it. One of them says that he wants to make America great again or keep America great most recently. The other one talks a lot about restoring the soul of America as if America was a, a living being of some kind. And has, has spoken also about how, how much we can achieve when we do things together as a nation, right? Now, these two guys and their supporters, admittedly, have very different ideas about what constitutes greatness or what constitutes the soul of America. But isn't the idea of making America great again or restoring the soul of America, aren't they sort of down underneath same kind of idea? They sound really similar to me. I understand they're not the same, and I understand the approach is different, and the things that they hope to accomplish are different, but the underlying idea about recovering some past value like we always knew we were is sort of a common denominator in both understandings. I feel like the underneath that is I hear this little voice that says isn't America shiny? I mean look at all its achievements. Look at all that it's accomplished. Look at all its power and influence. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it glorious? Isn't it so shiny? I guess I could say precious. If I were a Lord of the Rings fan, which of course I am. So I buy precious. Yes, precious. There's a a sense in which which I think we in, in the American church particularly, we miss stuff like this. And I, like I said, I, I hear this little voice underneath saying, saying, America is the greatest. America is the best. Isn't America shiny? Don't you want to recapture the glory? Don't you want to be wonderful? Don't you want to be Whatever. And the big question for me, for us as as Christians in this place, is why do we even care about the greatness of the place in which we live? I mean, why is that even a thing for us? If we believe like the song says, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. If we really believe that, then why does the the ultimate value of, of, of this nation, whether it's better or worse than other countries, or it's, its relative greatness even matter to us? Is greatness something that Christians should value? Is The United States of America being the best country in the world, why Jesus died? Is extolling the virtues of the United States the eternal gospel that we have been commissioned to proclaim? I would give that a resounding no. 
And I'm not saying that we can't be happy about the place that we live. I'm not saying that we can't be grateful. I'm not saying that we can't have affection for it. But maybe it's worth exploring how much affection we have. How much devotion we give to the state. To our nation. To our country. The way in which we we honor and, and show its worth. That's what worship is, after all. It's about declaring the worth of something, the value of something. And I know that nobody in this room would ever say or ever believe that they are worshiping the United States of America. But maybe it's worth the examination to say, well, what are my attitudes? What are my perspectives? What value do I place? What ritualistic activities do I engage in? surrounding the United States. Brothers and sisters, the, uh, the names of the nations and the empires and the kingdoms change. Whether it's Assyria or Babylon or Greece or Rome or Britain or um, Germany or the United States. The names change, but the system stays the same always encouraging us to value our national identity above all else, always deceiving us into striving for the greatness of our nations, always tricking us into believing that no other nation in the world is as good as ours. For who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? Jesus is speaking in this cycle, particularly to the suffering, persecuted church, encouraging them to remain faithful. The beast and the false prophet will try and deceive you. They will try and coerce you. They will try and trick you. And to get you to, and to well, ultimately to pledge your allegiance to the beast may alleviate your suffering for now. If you do, if you're one of those people living in ancient Rome and the... Um, The civil government says, hey, you know, why don't you ever go to the theater? Why don't you participate in these civic events? Are you against our country? Are you against the empire? Because you don't participate in these events? And it would be very easy to to just go. And many did. And afterwards, there was a whole big dispute about whether those people should be let back in the church or not. Because they acquiesced. They didn't stand. They caved. They caved did what was easy, alleviated their suffering for, for the moment. And that's what, what Jesus says, that you can, if you pledge your allegiance to the beast, if you worship, receive its mark, you may alleviate your suffering for now. But, but when judgment day comes, those who have suffered for their faithfulness will find rest for their souls, but those who sold out to the beast will drink full the cup of God's wrath. We're taught to fight for what we believe in, right? You've got to fight for what you believe in. You guys hold that to be true? I mean, is that a thing that... that I, I mean, I think I was taught that. All the stories, all the movies, all the TV shows kind of you know, gear us in that direction. All our cultural things teach us about fighting for what we believe in. And maybe that's true when it comes to politics and to the agenda of nations and states and parties. But here's what struck me in Revelation. That when it comes to the Christian church, when it comes to the Christian faith, I think what Jesus is saying to the church here in in this section of Revelation is not that you have to fight for what you believe in, but that you have to lose for what you believe in. You need to lose for what you believe in. This is what Revelation says in this section. Revelation 12, 11, But they have, this is the 
how they've conquered the dragon, but they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life, even in the face of death. Or in 13.10, let anyone who has an ear listen. If you are to be taken captive, into captivity you go. But if you kill with the sword, with the sword you must be killed. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Or from our passage this morning in Revelation 14. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. I get a very distinct sense from this section of Revelation that Jesus expects the church to accept the consequences of living a life in opposition to the system of the world, to die, if necessary, in order to maintain their witness. And this is where the very idea of martyrdom comes from. The Greek word is marturion from which we get martyr, which translates to witness or testimony. The willingness to die as a witness to the strength of your faith. That's what a martyr is. That's what martyrdom is. Jesus expects us to accept the consequences. If you're going to live a life that's in opposition to the system of the world, there are going to be consequences for that. And I think what Jesus is saying to the church is is to just accept those consequences as part of that life of faith. I mean, this is consistent with the rest of the New Testament, right? What does Jesus say? Tells his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is what's happening in Revelation 14, 13, 12. You want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, for my sake, you will find it. Our witness, our testimony is how we defeat the dragon by the blood of the lamb and by our witness, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. As I said on Tuesday, our witness is the only weapon we have in our fight against the powers and principalities of this present darkness. It's the only weapon we need, but it's the only weapon we have. And if we break it, then we have nothing. Be faithful until death, Jesus tells the church in Sardis, and I will give you the crown of life. The last time I preached on this passage, which was 10 years ago, I asked the questions, what was the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God worth to you, and uh, what is it worth risking? Um, But those are not the questions that I have today. The questions I have today are, are we willing to lose the idea that the United States of America is or should be a Christian nation? if it means preserving our witness to the world of the love of God in Christ Jesus? Are we willing to take the path of the cross and allow the world to win the battle in the sure and certain hope that God will triumph in the war? Are we willing to accept the truth that victory for the followers of the Lamb, is not achieved through overpowering the world, but through willingly losing to it, so that the love and power and glory of God may be revealed through us. I can't tell you the number of times in the Old Testament where uh, Gideon is the primary example that always comes to mind. You have too many people. You have too many people to fight this war, this battle. Uh, You'll think you did it. At 20,000, no, that's too many. That's too many. You get down to 300. All right, that's good. There's no way you can possibly think that your 300 people beat this innumerable, innumerable army. And then you'll realize that it wasn't you that did it after all. It was me. It was God 
who did it. This is, we, we, we can't overpower the world, brothers and sisters. We can't. But God can. And the path that God chose, the path that Jesus walked, was a path where he made his witness. He made his proclamation. He irritated the powers that be. And they executed him for it. And he let them. Because he knew that God would triumph in the end. Brothers and sisters, the systems of the world, the kings and kingdoms and nations and empires and cultures all wield the power of the dragon. They all do. And they will do what they always do. Seek to destroy all who oppose them. Our task as the church is to live a life of faithfulness and love and gratitude. To bear witness to the joy of our salvation in the world. And to invite others to do the same. Not to compel them to live as we do, but to invite them to do so. And when the arrows of the enemy inevitably come at us, because they will, they always do, to accept the consequences of being a follower of Jesus Christ in a world that seeks to destroy everything and everyone associated with him. Accept the consequences. Blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. They will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. This is a call for the endurance of the saints. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will clean
Will you join me once again this morning in prayer? Lord our God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose for us. God who creates, sustains, and provides, we are grateful for your many blessings. We thank you for the gift of life and being. We thank you for homes, for rain, for sun, for all that nourishes the earth. We give you thank, we give you thanks for families and friends and people with whom to, to celebrate, with whom to share our grief and pain and sorrow, people with whom we can share our gifts. Lord, we thank you for for who you are, for the gift of your Son, for the path of the cross that he walked to bear our burden so that we might have joy, so that we might be saved. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings to us, for for the ways in which you have have blessed us in the past and the ways in which you are doing so now. God, who cares, heals, and saves, we claim your love for this whole world, so lost and so broken and so loved by you. We offer to you now, silently or aloud, our prayers for others, for ourselves, and for the world around us. Lord, we entrust to your keeping and care all those faces and names for whom we have prayed in the silence, knowing that you are a gracious and loving God, knowing that you care for your people, knowing that that you care about what's important to us. We pray that you will be a helper to them, O Lord a peacemaker and a physician and a comforter to those who are in need. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our own hearts to you. So guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, as you will, to bear witness for your kingdom and to give glory to you, our Lord and our Savior. Through Jesus Christ, we pray, as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would like to contribute to the mission and ministry of St. John's, please feel free to send your offering to the address on the screen. Thank you.
Uh, our profession of faith this morning is on the back of the bulletin. It is the UCC Statement of Faith. It will also be on the screen. Um, let us say together what we believe. We believe in God, the Eternal Spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the worlds into being, creates humanity in his own image, and sets before us the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges people and nations by his righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, bidding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. Our sending song this morning is number two. Not what that says, I don't think. 254 in the red hymnals. Um, Well, it'll be on the screen too. Brothers and sisters, when I talk about losing, willfully losing to the world, I want to make clear that I don't mean that we just acquiesce. What I mean is that we stand, that we defy for us, I defy for me, I resist the powers of evil, struggle against the powers of evil uh, and the powers and principalities of this darkness, but I also accept then the consequences for that resistance. If into captivity I must go, then into captivity I go. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, because the victory comes over the dragon, 
through the blood of the Lamb and through the testimony of the saints because they did not cling to life in the face of death. I don't just do whatever the world system wants me to do. I follow the way of the cross. And if that leads me into captivity, then into captivity I go. And if that leads me to death, then to death I go. And I remain faithful. That's the call that Christ sets before the church. Live the life of faithfulness. Bear witness to the cross of Jesus and accept whatever consequences may come because of that. And remain faithful until the end. Jesus says, and I will give you the crown of life. That's what I mean when I say willfully losing to the system of the world. Because Jesus, that's what Jesus did. He let the world win its battle. He willfully went to the cross to die. But he knew something the world didn't know. That he would rise again. And we have that same knowledge, which should make it easy for us to accept those consequences. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you courage. Amen. Amen.